presentation, um, our speaker is going to interact with our panel. So I'd like to introduce them and thank them for being here and participating. So Rachel Ipsum is an RN, she's a graduate of the summer, she's an RN, and she is a parent to four children, three of whom are on the autism spectrum, correct? Her and her husband have been married for 11 years. So thank you for being here. I'm going to go right behind them. They can see me. But, um, Emily is uh, in Hawaii at the Seattle College, and she's also on the board of the autism program. Okay. Uh, her and her husband are parents of 15-year-old Nathaniel, who is also on the autism spectrum. So. Emily works here at Lucilla in development and alumni relations. She works at fundraising, special events, and alumni relations with the college. Anything else I need to add? Yeah. Okay. Corporal well, Richard Height, she's with the Plymouth Police Department, and she's also a school resource officer for the Plymouth Community Schools. Um, she's been in law enforcement for 22 years, and she joined the police department. Police Department in 2001. Um, she has been the school resource officer in the starting her third year, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, she resides in Plymouth with her husband and four stepchildren and her two year old nephew. And she's also my Zuma buddy, my Wagra Rogan's buddy, my, <laughs> my Martin's go to person. So thank you for, for participating. I probably don't have to introduce this gentleman, Sheriff Matt Haskell. Um, he's a seven, 1977 graduate of Freeman High School and a 1981 graduate of Indiana State University. He's a 33-year veteran of the Freeman Police Department, serving the last 14 years as chief. And as we all know, in September of 2015, he became the elected sheriff for, for Marshall County. And I have to say that from the moment I called Sheriff Castle and told him about this workshop, has been on board and has been more supportive than I can ever thank him for. Answering all my emails promptly and all my all my phone messages. So I mean I'm so proud of my community. You guys came through and I thank you for that. Joe Baker is the executive director for InSource, and that's the organization that I work for. We're a parent training uh, information center. We provide uh, training and information resources to uh, parents, to schools, to individuals uh, regarding children with special needs. We work with children from K through 12. So I might have met some of your children already at case conferences. And <coughs> just keep it in mind, if you have a child with special needs in the film schools, now you have a face to insource. And that's me and Joel. Joel and his wife, me, and are raising two children, Melissa and Christopher. Not only are they children with special needs, they are also children of a different ethnicity. They're African American, Joel and his wife are Caucasian. So there's a double, a double challenge there. But I think what I remember from Joel telling me about his family, he said, I have a wife and I have two kids and nobody in my household is the same DNA. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's kind of made me realize, you know, I, what I appreciate about working with families with special needs that you have to keep that sense of humor, you know, in order to, to, to uh, meet the challenges. So for all our parents here that are here, I thought the panelists, I thank you so much for taking part in this event tonight. Um, I just wanted to say the bathrooms are at the door and around to the left. So, you know, and then go ahead, we're, we're ready for you to eat. So, She is our new director of what is the APAC program at Ancilla College, which is the Office of Program at Ancilla College. We are running our first cohort of whether it's six or seven. Uh, and we will expand that the next few year or two, uh, maybe by January the 3rd of March, maybe not that soon. Uh, she's, she's come on board in July and has really pulled the beginning pieces of this program together, just like the issue. See who she is. Thank you. 
So, uh, as I've been getting ready for this discussion, is this is this annoying? Should I just turn this off? Seems like there's a lot of feedback. As I've been getting ready for this discussion, I've been doing a lot of preparation by uh, talking uh, to people in your field as much as possible. I'm uh, I know a lot about autism. I work with a lot of people with developmental disabilities, but. Uh, you know, in many ways, I, need, I needed to learn uh, about what sort of experiences you are having in the field. Uh, you know, I talked to my, my father, who is both a parent and a first responder. I talked uh, to a couple of my friends who had family members and were first responders. Uh, but the thing that I love the most about this setting that I think is the most powerful is that it's an intimate setting that we can all have a discussion about the situations that, that you've encountered and maybe try to think through strategies. When we talk later, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about some tips, but again, as much as possible, we wanna try to think through these scenarios uh, as much as we can. Uh, I'm really excited that Jack Daly has come with us today. Jack Daly is the Director for Protective Services through Logan. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, for whom the, the care, their care and safety falls into him and his department. Uh, what's also wonderful is Jack has been uh, leading the charge in St. Joseph County uh, for developing a program for first responders and working with people with developmental disabilities. So he's a wonderful asset and I'm really excited that we can have him here. Uh, so, but what, I, what we're going to do first, we're going to talk a little bit to our, our panel who's volunteered their time today. And I prepared, uh, maybe I can get this so I can see, I prepared uh, a list of questions that I was going to use just as a starting point for our panel, but you know we'll see how the discussion goes, and, and hopefully we can uh, talk about things that are going to be useful to all of you. Uh, I would encourage you, if you have any questions for the for the panel, please raise your hand and ask the questions because uh, it's really kind of a cool panel that we have together. Uh, and so I guess what I was hoping for first is maybe. Each of you could speak for a little bit about what your motivation was for being on this panel, whether you know personal or professional, and, and what led you to want to be a part of this, other than Jay knocking on your door. And, yeah. I've been nominated to start. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Joel Maynard. As a uh, Jane explained earlier, thank you for that, Jane. Um, I am a transracial foster adoptive father to two children with special needs. Um, and uh, their names are Alyssa and Christopher. Uh, they are ages four and seven. Uh, and they are, uh, as Josh was sharing, I can relate to that. They're a large part of who I am and uh, what I do. I'm the Executive Director of InSource, uh, Indiana Resource Center for Families with Special Needs. 
and we serve the entire state of Indiana. Um, my family lives in South Bend, but we do spend uh, a large amount of our summer here in Marshall County on Lake of the Woods. So, um, local connection there. <laughs> um, I do want to thank everyone here, especially the first responders for your service. Um, and it's very heartening to be in the same room as people who uh, care about the purpose of this meeting tonight. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you to Ancilla for hosting and for the funders that make it possible. And again, a special thanks to Jane. Someone described it as a spark plug behind this, so I think that's a good description in general. Um, I don't know how much to say, Josh. I did have some, some things written down, but I don't want to go too far not let the microphone make it down that way, so speak for a couple minutes and... Sure. Okay. Sheriff has to elbow me if I take too much time here. Okay. <laughs> so, um, a couple things to, to talk about tonight. Um, I'm here because, one, I'm a parent, um, and two, because uh, I, I work in the area of special education, and I talk a little bit about both of those. Um, when my children came into my life, um, I knew that they had special needs. I didn't know what they were. <laughs> but I knew that they had special needs, and um, that is a reality that every parent who has a child with special needs faces. Um, some, sometimes a, a label comes into the picture, but first and foremost, that's always a person, and that's always a child. And that's, I think, a big part of what I have to share is seeing individuals with disabilities as being individuals um, and as being people first and foremost. Um, I'm going to define disability for you a little bit as well. And this is more from the angle of the special ed world than um, other aspects of getting at that question. But uh, according to Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And so a life activity could be eating, um, breathing, standing, sitting, walking, uh, learning, thinking, things like that. And one thing that this connects to my story because my children have disabilities that are that aren't obvious. Um, you could you, you can see them walking around, and um, they are educated in a, in a typical setting. Um, but there are definitely ways in which their disabilities does impair their major life activities. And um, <laughs> in fact, the ways that their disabilities do impair their, their life are of real interest to me when it comes to how they may interact with the first responder. <laughs> if that were to ever happen. So, so what are some examples? Yeah, yeah. so um, I, I didn't really want to get into the, the alphabet soup of describing what the various things are, but um, I did come up with a list of symptoms um, and, and reasons my the therapies and, and medications my children take, so I'll read from that. Um, so think of a four-year-old who's actually a really tall four-year-old. He's larger than most first graders. He's almost four feet tall. Then think of my daughter. Um, and uh, just imagine these two kids. Okay, keep them keep them in your mind. And uh, so between the two of them, and I won't get specific as to who, who, who does what for this, but uh, they, they take medications to treat symptoms of mental illness that causes disturbed or unusual thinking, loss of interest in life, and strong or inappropriate emotions take medication or therapy to treat or prevent episodes of frenzy, that normal excited mood, symptoms of depression. Between the two of them, they take medication to treat depression and excessive worry and tension that disrupts daily life. They, treat, uh, they take medication to treat difficulty in focusing, controlling their actions, and remaining still or quiet um, compared to children that are the same age. They also take medication and therapy to treat children who have a developmental problem that causes difficulty communicating and interacting with others, and to help control irritable behavior such as aggression, temper, temper tantrums, frequent mood changes, 
and um, the need to perform repeated motions or repeat words and sounds. So, I'm a parent, <laughs> and uh, I, you know, um, and that, they, they're four and seven now, so they're still like cute. And I was, you know, sharing with Peter, like, oh, that's a fun age. I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, but uh, they won't be small and cute forever. Uh, they will grow, and um, some of these, some of these things may change over time. But I, I get the sense that a lot of this is going to be a part of what their life looks like when they come to be an adult. And so, um, <laughs> as a first responder, you know, I. I can only imagine what goes through your mind. Um, and uh, again, I thank you for all that you do for our community. Um, the, the individuals that you encounter um, could very well have um, some of the individual disabilities that I just described. This isn't the whole list of everything. This is just close to home for me, um, what my kids might um, exhibit if you were to encounter them. Um, I'm going to finish with a little bit of a dip into the special ed world. So there's a very important law called IDEA. Um, does anyone know what the I stands for in IDEA? James will have to answer. <laughs> yes? You, you, you don't? Yes. Very good. So you have the whole thing. Thank you. Ah, special ed teacher. <laughs> um, Individuals is the first word there, and that's kind of back again to my point tonight. See individuals first, see people first. Um, and, and special education is oriented around the unique needs of individuals. We spend a lot of time uh, working with families to help, help craft educational programs for their children that do meet their unique needs. Unique needs and individuals. The individuals first. I did mention the labels and the alphabet C tonight because that's not who they are. They are my children. Uh, they're members of our community. Um, I'm going to say a little bit about person-first language. Um, person-first language is a way of talking about individuals before you talk about their disabilities. And it's a way of not defining someone based on that disability. And uh, usually, what we say is a reflection of what we're thinking. The words don't always come out right. <laughs> but what we say is a reflection of what we think. And if we can think and speak in words, we're talking about people first, as opposed to introducing their disability before you even mention them, um, that can be a way of helping us think and act with individuals first. So um, just as an example of some person-first language, um, Instead of saying someone who's confined or restricted to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound, you would say a person who uses a wheelchair. Um, instead of saying someone who's hearing impaired, you'd say someone who is hard of hearing, a person who's hard of hearing. Um, instead of saying someone who's a CP victim, you'd say a person with cerebral palsy. So the theme there, <laughs> again, back to my kind of point here tonight, is people first. Um, and, you know, the, we, with NSARS, we work a lot directly with service providers through school. Um, and so we, we, we're used to saying that because they're someone's pride and joy, their children, their babies. And uh, person first is a way of um, treating someone with disability just in a way that anyone else would want to be treated as. First, a person, an individual, um, and in the case of their education, an individual. Those are my comments. Well, <clears throat> my interest in being here tonight, uh, of course, Jane uh, spearheaded it with the uh, report of me about the Ancella initiative here for autism. And uh, also, my experience uh, 35 years in law enforcement, I have noticed an increase in dealing with individuals with disability. And also, the important thing is uh, we have a diverse community. They're part of that community, and we need you know, to do our due diligence to learn how to deal most effectively and professionally with them, meeting their needs uh, as we go about trying to do our, um, our jobs as first responders. Um, again, I have a lot of experience, but I also come here with wanting to take some stuff away 
way with it. Uh, I'm here to learn also. And I'm excited uh, about the initiative, and I really hope it's going to be successful. Um, my wife has had a lot of experience working with uh, uh, high ability students at the School City of Mishawaka, where most of them she has played as me is on the autistic scale. And uh, I want to, I want every child to be successful. So that's my reason for being here. Hi, I'm Bridget Height. Um, the biggest reason I think I wanted to be here, um, besides Jane asking and kind of telling or influencing <laughs> the whole decision, was that um, I love talking to everybody. But there's also those times that um, that when I'm talking, that I know they can't verbally talk back to me. And sometimes that's hard for me. So it's me in the learning and processing through this whole thing on how to deal with other students, other ones that just come in my office or through um, being a first responder that I can communicate with but not necessarily have to do it on a verbal. It can be other ways that we can learn on how. And I did have checked into um, wanting to go to some autism classes because I think it's an interesting field that Everybody has a story, is what I say, and they have just as much of a story as we do. So that's what I get. Hi. Hi. Is that better? Okay. My name is Emily Petzl. I am a parent of a 15-year-old sophomore at EHS, getting to know Bridget. Knows my son, but not in a bad way. It's a good thing to learn. Um, I also work here at Insulin College, uh, and I am on the Autism Advisory Board for the New APAC program, and uh, that's a thrilling thing for me that we are starting this program. I'm so glad Kristen's here. Um, it's, it is a new kind of dawning of a new day. There are so many people in the community that are being recognized in a positive light uh, rather than a negative um, way that they're different, but they are not not equal. And so it's important for us to recognize that, but I'm excited to be able to, as a parent, express what some of my concerns would be. My son is really normal. He's 15, he is doing driver's ed, he plays soccer and golf and basketball and rides a scooter, and he's very polite and respectful, and if you met him in public, you would not have a clue. But there are times, and um, situations that occur and uh, he's a different person and I can never guarantee when that might happen and so it's important for me that uh, people who may find it necessary to interact with my son understand he's not the only one um, and some of the key points that I think would help make that situation go better so I appreciate all that you do as first responders um, it's a tough job and um, I respect it very much, and I appreciate well being here. So, thank you, Emily. Can you say uh, instances in which you talk about when he behaves differently, uh, even though he might not look look different? What are some examples of things that he might do, say, in a chaotic situation? Um, Nate does not like uh, loud, busy places. Bridget and I were just talking about the lunchroom at school. So, for instance, uh, he finds random places to eat his lunch. Sometimes they're legal that a teacher will let him use their room. Sometimes he finds a corner and sits there uh, because he cannot deal with that chaos in there. It is overwhelming and it, um, it as he tells me, it, it makes his brain hurt. And um, so rather than put himself in that situation where he knows that he's going to feel badly when it's over, he just finds a different way. Um, but there are situations where um, there's a, maybe a large group of, of kids his own age and they're involved in a verbal discussion. Nate actually tries to be kind of the person who makes other people calm down and things might escalate and then he's the one that um, physically gets a, a little because he feels like he's defending himself. And he knows what he's trying to do, but he can't explain to you what he's trying to do. He knows that he's trying to do the right thing and make somebody stop fighting, but 
maybe he didn't go about it the right way. Um, and then at that point, his mind is going a thousand miles an hour, and you're not going to be able to stop him, and, and you can't touch him. You, you can't physically touch him because that, I don't know what would happen at that point. Um, it's just a, a thing where his brain goes so fast, and um, he doesn't know why he does what he does, but he just would lash out. And that's, that's a scary thing. Um, you know, he's, he's not the kind of kid that you would expect to be in those situations, but they can happen. I and mean, he's a 15-year-old kid, and he can be around other 15-year-old kids. So, but Rachel has more examples than I do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I've been working in healthcare for over 15 years, and you're always learning new things. But until I became a mother, I really didn't know what autism was or what it meant to family members. Um, it's changed how we go to the grocery store, what time we go during the day. It's changed what kind of school my child can go to, uh, what kind of foods we eat at home. Things have changed in so many ways. But the reason why I wanted to be here today is to share my experience and you know what has happened to us a couple of years ago. Um, one day I decided that I would move an entertainment stand all by myself. And it decided that it would collapse on my face. And it's got to my nose. Um, my son, who was in the house at the time, seen me bleeding, and he was pretty upset, but I, I managed to calm him down, put myself up a bit, decided to drop him off at mom and dad's house, and then my husband and I went to the emergency room, make sure nothing was broken. And they gave us some great pain meds. So I went home, and my husband said, I'm going to clean up this entertainment stand, all these boards and things, so nobody else gets hurt on it. Great idea. So he slips on one of the boards, falls off the deck, breaks his leg in two different spots, all in the same day. So at first, he's rolling around all you know, on the grass, and I thought he was making fun of me, because that's what we do in our family, we teach each other. And then I realized, no, he's actually in pain. I know. I'll call my mom and dad to help me. My husband's six one, almost three hundred pounds. He's a big fella. Um, but at the time, being on the pain medication, I didn't know any better. So my parents get to my house, and they're like, "Oh, Rachel, yeah, no, that's not happening. We're gonna call my mom." So grateful for the EMT people that came to our house, and you know they took care of my husband, got things under control, but they they also needed. The so it took 10 people to get him off the floor, or the grass, I should say. Meantime, like I said, pain medication, I'm not thinking like a normal regular would be. My son was in the, in the house. My son has a sensory integration dysfunction. He's very hypersensitive to a lot of stimulus, lights, noise, even movement in the room. It sets him off in, in different ways. but. He was by the window, well, it's a, a screen door, and I glanced at him, and he's rocking back and forth. That's what he does. Covers his ears, and he's screaming. And at that moment, it just broke my heart because, you know, I'm trying to help the EMT and the fireman and answer questions, and I just felt like I couldn't help them. And the EMT and the fireman were very busy, you know, taking care of my husband, very grateful for that. And at one moment, one of the um, firemen seen my children in the window, and he's like, man, what can I do for your children? He asked me. And I said, um, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know. Because at that moment, in that emergency moment, I didn't know what to do. As a mother, who has been in healthcare for 15 years, <laughs> luckily my parents, my mother, who was wonderful with my children, came inside and said, it's okay right now. And I thought, wow, if I'm like that, and I'm nurse now, but that's when it wasn't, if I'm like that, imagine what other people react in situations like that. How is the child able to communicate with parents or any kind of situation like that? How are they able to talk to them? You know, how can they cope with that? And that is why I'm here today, not only to share. 
my story, but maybe get some feedback from you guys. I want you to tell me what I can do for the future and how I can help my children prepare for something like that. Great, Rachel. With that, sir, my, so my next question has to do with circumstances in which you've all encountered. Uh, with that circumstance in particular, um, the first responders who were there, what were some examples of things that they did in that circumstance that were helpful? And in that specific circumstance, uh, where do you think you know more training would would have helped them in that circumstance? Well, for one, even asking in general helped quite a bit because. You know, as a wife and a mother, I'm not thinking straight. And just somebody to make things clear and set you back on your head, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, what I would have asked the parent is, um, you know, if they're, you know, if they're reacting like that, maybe not in the norm compared to another child who doesn't have disabilities, I would probably say, um, my son doesn't like to be touched. You know, Emily's son doesn't like to be touched. Uh, but sitting down with the child in a calm manner, you know, my son won't make eye contact with you. You know, just because he's not looking doesn't mean he's not listening to you. So I keep that in his calm. I think that's a, a really important point, and I think my brother is actually also a really good example of this. Uh, so my brother is essentially non-verbally, has very limited communication, but he can hear and understand almost everything that, that you can say to him. So I think, you know, in this circumstance, and I think in a lot of circumstances, even if, if it doesn't appear like somebody can understand you, uh, just being able to s slowly and calmly talk them through what's happening, and if you're having, if they have to do something, like if they have to go onto an ambulance, or you know, if they have to, if you have to give some sort of treatment to them, or maybe to their parents in this circumstance, um, being able to talk it through with them, even if you're unsure about whether they can understand, because even if they can understand, that sort of uh, verbal reassurance, I think is, is going to be really helpful in those circumstances. So I, I guess I, want, I wanted to open that question up to everybody. Sorry. <coughs> what are some instances in which um, you've either interacted with somebody with an intellectual or developmental disability or vice versa, um, you've been in circumstances where somebody with an intellectual or developmental disability is interacting with a first responder. And what are some things in those situations that you think went well or you would have wanted some more training for, for any of you? Well, I think the first thing that comes to mind to go in the line. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, most of my experience comes from Britain, and we were actually involved with the crisis plan for several autistic students. We were brought in, we gave ideas of what we could do. But what I really appreciated um, in these situations, basically, the student became very violent, um, throwing things, anybody that's close to it. Um, and what we found is that the special ed teacher had been working with a plan for when he felt that way uh, to uh, have him get on the ground and then they had a heavy blanket that they would put over him and then all we had to do was stand back and let him wind down. And you're right, you don't touch all officers in the department every year. You don't touch an autistic child to try to and take them, any, take them anywhere because that just escalates and makes it worse. What I found is back off, give them their space, and clear everybody away so they can't reach these people and let them confuse themselves. Another great thing is we had grandmas that is, were on call from school. We didn't have a resource officer, unfortunately, and uh, she would be at that school in three minutes. And because of her experience dealing with her granddaughter, she was far better at resolving the issue uh, than we could be. Because at the end of the day, they're going to be left with the specialist that's going to help the child through this. And we're going to walk out. I mean, they're not going to be arrested. They're not going to be. Uh, we had one case where we would take them to the hospital for an eval. 
Um, but that was all part of the crisis plan that provided the local center, the special education teacher, the principal, that whole thing. Um, but I guess to have a plan and try to find something that works and train the, the, the student. And I think that helps. And tell us right away if you know. I mean, we're coming to a scene, we're trying to identify is this drugs? Is this just an angry, angry person? Is this a depressed person? What are we dealing with? We have seconds to identify that. Tell us he's autistic, he has disabilities. That that would be a red flag for us. So. I think the, I think there's there's two really important points that I don't want to go away from for a second. I think one important point that you talked about is is when you arrive looking to uh, the person that knows the child best, right? Uh, in some instances, that's going to be the parent. Some instances, that's going to be some sort of school resource person. Uh, some instances, that actually might be a neighbor. Uh, if it's the, uh, an instance in which the parent is hurt or in trouble, it might be a sibling. There are adults who are either on their own or in supported living, even they, will likely have some sort of direct support professional that will be working for them. You aren't always going to have somebody there, but your first instinct in those instances is look to somebody that knows the child, somebody or adult, somebody that knows how they communicate, how much they understand, what are the things that set them off or help them de-escalate. And if you're able to get that information, from the person that's their caregiver that knows the individual, that's going to be your absolute best resource in those circumstances. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to remember the, the there was a, a second point that you had uh, that was really really important. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll circle back to it, uh, but that's a, uh, that's an excellent example of, uh, of of being able to utilize the resources that are there for. story, I guess, like, um, I was my first year as a school resource officer, and uh, I think it was it was the summer prior to, and uh, it was a county officer, and they found a little child walking, and when we found that child walking, no verbal skills, no anything to, all he had was an iPad in his hand that was trying to get him to where he was trying to go. So. My immediate response was he, would, he wasn't talking to us, he wasn't communicating. Um, we were trying to get him to walk back where he was, um, to which he didn't have shoes or um, socks on or anything. Um, and at that time it was getting dark, so we were kind of concerned. Um, and what ended up happening was I ended up taking a picture of the child and sending it to Menominee School teachers, thinking that, oh, okay, hey, they, they might know him. He's, this is where he would go to school at. And actually, in reality, it, um, he ended up going to the um, Lighthouse um, Autism School. But one of the teachers recognized him from going there in kindergarten. So we felt very blessed that he really hadn't wandered too far, but he was very where they were. But it got the parents to put alarms on the door because he just ended up walking out and they didn't know he was gone. So that, in talking uh, with the first responders that I talked to and to parents, uh, that's actually one of the really frightening things, especially individuals with autism that we see a lot. Individuals with autism, uh, some of them have a tendency to wander or elope. Uh, and this is from a, a misperception or a, a misunderstanding or not being able to perceive danger and really just sort of following what your interest is at that moment. Uh, and if you can't perceive the danger of traffic, or you can't perceive the, day, perceive the danger of water, or maybe not having a people around you who care for you and would look out for you. If you can't perceive those dangers, uh, then you're probably just gonna walk into those dangers without knowing necessarily what's gonna happen. Uh, and we actually do see this a lot. We hear a lot from our parents. One of the biggest struggles is that as much as you keep your, try to keep your eye on your children all the time, there are gonna be that moment of those moments where they escape. Um, one of the, the things that I would really try to stress is that, you know, if you're in those circumstances, um, you know, again, again, first, if you can, let 
get the parent, let the parent know and see if you can get the information from the parent about what sort of things that child might be interested in. Maybe they go to the water. Maybe they go into other people's houses and go into their fridge. If you can get that information, then first of all, that's going to help you locate the child if the child is missing. Uh, second, in addition to that, um, I would really encourage uh, as much as possible, uh, a lot of parents feel a tremendous amount of guilt for a, a situation like this. Uh, for a child that's somebody who elopes, who goes away. Um, so uh, as much as you can in those circumstances, be supportive of the parent. And for example, uh, if you have any suggestions for them about improving the safety of their yard, for example, either alarms or fences or those sorts of things, uh, as much as you can, be supportive of the parent in those circumstances, because uh, it can be a really frightening uh, situation for a parent in that circumstance. I had a question for you. Um, you mentioned the use of a weighted blanket. Now, was that with the child, or did you guys have that with you? Uh, the special education teacher. Oh, they, they had one? Yeah. Oh. That, that was part of their they, they actually worked with him to make this part of his plan. Oh, that's <laughs> So I guess following following up on that, going away from the tangible situations and really sort of looking at practical suggestions, uh, either as a, as, a, as a first responder or as a, a parent or a loved one, uh, what sort of suggestions would you have for either a first responder who's encountering this, these situations or vice versa uh, if you're working with a parent or somebody in a school as a first responder, what suggestions would you have to them to be able to help you those circumstances. Yeah. Well, I have good news because they've covered a lot of the topics. So I have a great job. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, from my perspective, um, a big thing for my son is, um, and I think a lot of kids with autism is, you can't give a lot of directions at one time. It's a one and done. He needs to have one instruction and then follow through on that and then go on. If you tell him to stop and sit down, he will turn around and look at you and say, which is it you want me to do? Not because he's being a smart mouth, but because in his mind, it's one or the other. In it, it, his mind, you just can't give him a lot of directions. If I give him three things to do in a row, he won't do that because he can't remember the third, he can't remember the first one by the time I tell him the third one. So he's he's very specific and sometimes and it seems like he's not listening, but his brain is not processing as fast as you're telling him to do something. And in an emergent situation where there's chaos going on, and if there's instructions being told, he can't he can't do all of the things you're telling him to do, like a person who would know to stop and lay down and put their hands on their above their head. He couldn't think to do all three of those things at one time. So it's kind of a process for how to get him to get from point A to point B without skipping the steps in between. I, I also think it's important to have one individual talking to that person. Um, because I know from my son's experience, if he has two people in front of them, he doesn't know which one to be speaking to or to listen to. And just like Emily, he can't do both at the same time. You know, it's a process. Um, I would also find a common interest um, that also helps my son calm down. You start talking about Legos, you're golden in his eyes. He will Lego you up. And it helps calm him down. I, I wanted to I wanted to add on to something you said too, if that's okay. Uh, I think uh, in addition to you know having one person uh, talk to to them and simplifying the sentences that you use, I think utilizing the person if you can that communicates with them the best. That might actually mean bending some of the rules a little bit. For example, uh, my brother. Um, who I, I had said was nonverbal, recently had a seizure uh, and had a pretty significant head injury. 
uh, and um, was really scared about going on an ambulance. Uh, and at first, the, the, the EMTs on the scene had said, you know, to my father, you know, we have to take him on the ambulance, you can't go on the ambulance. Uh, but once they realized, you know, how scared he was uh, and how, uh, how uh, my dad was the one who was able to understand and communicate with him, being flexible with that rule, for example, of having somebody else go on the ambulance made that whole trip a lot safer for my brother, and it was really a wonderful way to be flexible in this circumstance and being able to utilize that resource in my father that they had. Um, <clears throat> my suggestion to the parents, um, you know, this veteran saved police officers' lives. If you call in, if, if, if you call and the child has walked away or the child is uh, having issues, tell the dispatchers right away the type of um, disabilities that he may be uh, uh, facing because that will give us information and prepare us before we get to the scene to, to better deal with it. Um, I am totally in tune with the, uh, the uh, one person at a time slowly. My wife tells me the story when she would change activities in the classroom. She would actually literally have to say, okay, three minutes, we're going to stop doing this activity, and she would start a, a timer. And the students could all see the timer. And that, just to get them to stop what they were doing so she could go to the next step, and that was the new activity. Um, so information is key for us, and we can use that, and that will help us better deal with the situation. Sure, um, and, and I think that that's a wonderful idea. This isn't, this is something that I hadn't necessarily thought of yet, and this is, I look at the spark plug here as, as this being a wonderful idea. I actually think, uh, you know, as much as we work on trying to educate first responders in these circumstances, oftentimes the things that are going to be most helpful are sometimes going to be the things that you just talked about right there. Uh, so I wonder if there's any resources that we could put together for this community and for other communities such that parents of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities know what sort of information is going to be important when they call a dispatch, when they talk to a first responder. I think that education really goes both ways, and I think having that information available to parents in the, in, in the unforeseen circumstances in which they would encounter a first responder or call dispatch, I think that that would be really helpful to them as, as well. You. Um, so I, I spent a little bit of time talking about invisible disabilities. Um, I think that's been heard. <laughs> um, I so I'm a parent to a four and a seven year old, and they think police officers and first responders in general are pretty cool. <laughs> I look forward to telling them tomorrow because they'll probably be in bed by the time I get home about what I did tonight because they'll think it's pretty cool. They'll probably ask me about the vehicles that you drive and things like that. Um, my point here is that I think there's an opportunity when children are young to uh, develop and cultivate a good relationship and healthy understanding and respect for what you all do. And I would encourage any efforts to use that point of opportunity um, when they are young or you know even even older, just to to do to to reach out, especially um, if you expect and you might need to be involved in a school environment or, or even not to, to give um, individuals with disabilities who again indivisible you might not know but uh, but to just develop that relationship to realize that that's a person I know a name of someone who does that I, I feel like I can trust them um, and I think that will will help make it easier um, in some of those moments of crisis potentially Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate all that you do. Uh, I, I, I feel like I come away from these things on, on my end, coming up with new ideas, and I hope, Jane, we can follow through on, on some of those ideas I think, I think are really, really good ideas. 
Uh, I wanted to introduce Jack Daly. Jack Daly is the Director of Protective Services uh, at Logan, uh, and he's been responsible for putting together uh, a program in St. Joseph County. So he's going to talk a little bit about that uh, and his experiences there, uh, and that hopefully you'll find useful for developing these programs within your community. I'll give you a, 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 a synopsis, a capsuled synopsis about what we do at Logan Protective Services. We serve folks who meet three, meet three criteria. They have to be an adult, they have to be over 18, they have to have an IDD, an intellectual or developmental disability diagnosis. That's the current alphabet soup that used to be MR and that next year will be something else. But today it's IDD. And then the most important one, the third one, is they have to be endangered in some way. They have to have been abused, exploited, abandoned, uh, and exploitation can take any number of forms, as you all are aware, financial, sexual, whatever. Um, so a lot of the folks that we serve in protective services, they don't have teachers. They're not in school. Um, they may not have parents. They may have been turned out of the house. Um, they may, in fact, the closest people in their life may, may in fact, be perps who are exploiting them. Uh, we take referrals from irate neighbors, from parents who just couldn't handle the kids and don't have much to do with them but know what's going on. We work hand in hand with uh, St. Joe County APS, which I believe spans this area too. Uh, we get a lot of referrals with them. We meet with them. I do Monday morning all staff meetings. They're half a day long, uh, every Monday and they come in and join us every couple of months. So we go over what the referrals were that they laid on us the last meeting and where we're at with that and then we talk about who's new, who we're bringing to them, who they bring to us. So a lot of, a lot of interaction with that agency. Um, some years ago, I got called into a meeting at uh, St. Joe County Jail with the current sheriff at that time and the warden, uh, Jeannie Lawson, and uh, Ms. Lawson, and uh, I guess you'd say Julie, and the nurse at the jail and um, a couple of people in this field because the, in St. Joe County anyway, I'm not, I, I apologize, I'm not that familiar with the territory here in, in Plymouth. In St. Joe County, what they wanted to address was the fact that the police at that point had built up an aversion to going to the mental health provider in the area, which at that point was Madison Center, because they found that, okay, we got a fella here, it's a special needs case, maybe he doesn't belong in the county motel, We'll try something else. We'll go down to Madison Center. We'll see if they'll admit them uh, for observation and, and possibly short-term commitment or something, some kind of treatment. Um, but what they were finding out was they were sitting there for hours because there was, you know, they have to wait and wait and wait, and they end up dropping the guy and going. And then the next time something happened, they'd go to the county motel and not to Madison Center because they can't afford to take a half of their day off waiting for a doctor to respond to one person. So. In effect, what that did was made the St. Joe County Jail the de facto mental health provider for the area. And they were going nuts. And I don't blame them. Uh, you know, they're not necessarily staffed for that. They have a nurse who is, is hip to meds. Uh, but, you know, there were people in the county jail who probably were more appropriately served in other places. So we started conversations about how can we, how can we look at the idea of forensic diversion, okay? Is jail where this person belongs? Um, is, I'm just gonna read a little something I had prepped because it's a cheat sheet and I'll take advantage of it. Um, so the array of possible mental health issues you might be, might be waiting for you as a first responder, it's, um, it's mind boggling to say the least. As you've just heard uh, about the autism disorders, uh, there's a number of deve developmental disabilities with all kinds of issues surrounding them. Uh, and these presentations, this type of gathering is, is you know, uh, focused on what, how to deal with that really overwhelming array of conditions that you, know, uh, you may or may not be able to recognize. Uh, a lot of our folks, there's a concept that I heard somewhere in another presentation called psychological masking. I'd run into it operationally, but I didn't have that, that phrase. And it's basically amounts to somebody able to present a lot more competent and functional than they actually are. Um, I, have, I have fellows I serve who can't read or write, um, who uh, have a real trouble, have real difficulty processing information, but they've 
hone their skills and their social interaction, their communications to, you wouldn't necessarily pick up on that. So if that person decided to act out, you wouldn't necessarily say, oh, it's, a, it's a, a facet of his condition. You'd think he was being a smart ass or something, you pick him up. So they were, we, we're talking about that. We're talking about how to recognize what's presenting itself. If you have parents and you have teachers who can give you a heads up before you head off to the scene, boy, you're way ahead of the game, really. If they can tell you, don't come in with your lights and your hot sirens flashing because it's gonna drive my autism son nuts, then you're a step up from somebody just, they got a call, somebody's going wild next door, something's happening, you don't know, you're booking, and you may end up adding to your own difficulty. You're already meeting a difficult situation, so what we're trying to do is help you avoid adding to your own difficulty, right? So we're hashing that around, trying to get this first CIT training going, which is crisis intervention training. Uh, and you may or may not know all about that, but bear with me if you do. Um, it's a national thing. Uh, we used to have the Criminal Justice Task Force at Logan. That was before my days with this department, but still, I've been with Logan since 78. So uh, the Criminal Justice Task Force kind of went inactive. I came about 10 years ago, I joined Protective Services and they said, we want you to get this back going again. We started meeting with the, the other people and it grew into this CIT training through um, NAMI, National Alliance for Mental, uh, on Mental Illness. I'm not sure what the, the little word in the middle is. See the other one. But uh, they have this training that they do. It's actually a week long. It's, uh, it's, it's quite extensive. We were able to uh, tailor that to our situation in St. Joe we had, here's the thing about it. We went around and we invited people from every facet of, of who can help in this situation. We had people from Suicide Prevention Hotline. We had uh, folks from both the emergency rooms in St. Joe and Beacon Memorial. We had uh, dispatchers and police officers from St. Joe County Police, from Mishawaka Police, from South Bend Police, which is, which is saying something because it's an investment from the department. These guys were all doing this voluntarily and then the forces had to volunteer to pony up the salary to have somebody cover them and pay the guy who came to the seminar. So, you know, the, the, it was, there was an, uh, an investment by the police department in that training uh, because they thought it was going to be worthwhile. Uh, you know, I think the CIT training in Indianapolis and, and maybe some other places when they were just starting out, I think were engendered from Situations that went wrong, where somebody ended up hurt or dead, and uh, that started that program. Uh, so you're, you know, I'll, I'll stretch my neck out and say that the first, the, right off the bat, the, the focal points that uh, any first responder is, you know, uh, due to be doing in the performance of his duty, I think they can be summed up in two. If you're looking at, at a situation, you just roll up and you're trying to focus on it and and figure out what's what. You're trying to suss it out. Your first, first off is the prevention of harm. The prevention of harm to you, so you can still function. Prevention of harm to your partner, and I know that's primary. Secure the scene, make sure everybody else is, and protect the individual, but, so does the individual directly involved in a particular situation pose a threat to himself, but are any others at the scene, or whether they're relatives or bystanders or the responding officers themselves. You know, you've got, that's, check the situation out, secure it, that's, part for the course for you guys, I'm sure. And then the second focal point is, is tricky too, which is uh, criminality, you know. Um, just what is the nature of, of the situation? Is somebody else sitting on the ground clocked and bleeding? Has there been some kind of criminality, serious criminality involved that that's not gonna go away? You know, you're, you can't interpret that in some other way. You're, you're restricted by your rules and regs and by the laws. Certain things have to happen. But, uh, for some folks, that breaking of the law, it's inadvertent, it's not done knowingly. It's just, you know, it could be a, a part of their behavior. Uh, so, the entry of a first responder in any scene involving an individual under stress and uh, also exhibiting behaviors and characteristics associated with mental illness and uh, of some type, whether it's autism or schizophrenia or some type of uh, retardation or developmental disability. The tone taken by the first responders, uh, those initial actions, those interactions, I'm repeating, but it's important enough for you to hear it again. Uh, that means the difference between tragedy and a situation that you effectively defuse and de-escalate and take care of. It, your, your entry into it 
And the approach you take in, in sorting out a situation and plotting your own court of, course of action for that can make a whole difference in the outcome of that situation. Uh, it, you know, it, it'll help if the individual can see someone as being there to assist them, like you said, in sorting things out, not someone to fear or someone there to punish them. Uh, you know, developmental lags make it more difficult for an individual to understand exactly what it is you want from them. Uh, attention deficits, lags in the time it takes someone to process information, as well as, uh, you know, the physical and mental effects of any medications they might be taking, or even, in some cases, more importantly, not taken. Uh, any and all of these may be factors leading to behaviors that could, at first glance, appear like an individual being uncooperative or resistant to your requests or directions, but it just could be a function of, of their condition. You don't, it's, it's one, this is similar to new higher orientation. When I talk to them about what we do, no diss in there, I'm just saying that uh, it's, well, let me see. Let me tell you a couple of things. When we started this thing out, uh, we thought the best thing to do, and I, I was under the impression that that's what you were thinking about here. So let me suggest that it might be something to look into your, in your area if you're, if you're dealing with these type of situations regularly enough. Um, we wanted to get together all the people who were, you could call them stakeholders, people involved in that, that part of the process, in dealing with people who uh, had developmental legs, who were uh, dealing with mental illness and had run afoul of the legal system. Nowadays, here, and this is back 2010, we worked on it, I think we had the first one in 2012. Um, nowadays, what you're gonna see, and I'm sure you already are, um, with cutbacks in services, with service providing agencies uh, shrinking or disappearing or going out of business, um, you see a lot of people not on meds that they used to be on because they're, maybe they couldn't comply with the conditions set up by the folks that dispense the meds at the mental health provider, which is Oaklawn and Epworth now, when Memorial imploded and uh, got caught in all the Medicaid fraud and whatever. Uh, Epworth and Oaklawn both stepped in to divide up what they were doing. Oaklawn takes care of the outpatient services and Epworth does the inpatient and uh, short-term commitment type of things. And uh, other areas too, gerontology, et cetera. But, so we gathered all these people together and we had a, a pretty good number of representatives from the police forces there. And what impressed me the most was that they, and, and many of them said this, they didn't realize how many people were working in these same areas, right, right, right there, right in St. Joe County, that they could use as, as a resource. If they knew who would call and who would answer the phone. So we, we put together things like this, which is a, a, a guidebook, a flip chart, that we cranked out for the officers that they'd carry with them. It had uh, contact numbers and names for different organizations if you needed somebody. Uh, it, it has, uh, it gives you a, two or three pages of medications and what they might be for. I'll, I'll mention why that was important. Pardon me, I'm a little tangential, but let me just give it to you anyway. There's no parent. You're, you got called from a neighbor and you pull up and some guy's pulling a nutty on his porch and you wanna know what? What's going on here? Or maybe he can't talk to you, but maybe, maybe a partner or yourself can get a look in the medicine cabinet and see if there's any bottles. Are there medications in the bottles? Is there a doctor's name on there? Can you call that doc and find out what the story is with this guy? Because I think that's, those are the things. It's utilizing what presents itself as hints to you while you're just trying to sort out the lay of the land, you know? That seems like a good one. Um, so we've had two of these, three of these actually, uh, trainings. Um, the, odd, the object being to have CIT trained officers, ideally down the road, at least one available throughout the shifts. So that if somebody called up and said, I, I, you need to come here, but this is my kid and this is the condition, this is what you gotta do, then we started to educate our end users, our, our uh, people that we serve uh, and their folks, et cetera, that uh, they should, when they call in, if they ask for assistance, they should ask if there's a CIT officer on duty that shift so that they could be a part of that response. 
because then they've been sensitized. The folks, first off, I think the officers are bent that way who would, who would volunteer to go and spend three days doing this anyway, because it's a pretty, you know, it's a long grind. But um, building on that, there's, you know, the second years people are now populating even more shifts. It's still hit or miss. You still call up and have a situation. You, is, if there's a CIT officer, we want them to come ask if they could respond. And the person on the other end may or may not know what they were talking about. I think three years down the road, maybe they'll hit more people who do. So what we're trying to do is plant an awareness and, and grow a coverage so that there's that resource available to you guys, even if you're not the CIT officer, whatever shift you're, you're populating. But it takes that dedication from the police force to shell out the dough to cover the trainings. Um, but they, I think they're worthwhile. They're, they're making some differences. Um, we have another one. I'm up tomorrow. I'm having a meeting to talk about the next one. So you know, it does go on. Uh, you know, there's a you know there's a rising awareness of this. Enough hellacious scenes with people with mental issues who've decided that they're going to take out 12 other people as well as themselves, and you know that puts pressure, puts pressure on the mental health providers. It puts pressure on you guys. We got. What are we doing about this? What are you going to do about this? You know, I mean, I think these trainings. And the idea of sensitizing yourself to what does a condition look like? What might I see? How can I sort out whether this is somebody just being a punk or somebody who really can't help themselves? I think just taking the time to try to make that evaluation is a step up rather than jump in, the fellow freaks because there's lights flashing and that's not happening for him, and then the guy's cuffed up and gone to jail. That, it's, it's not quite as given that that's what's going to happen today, but it's taken five years and three trainings to try to foster that mentality, if you will, uh, through the people on the force who are already bent that way, and then they educate their folks, you know. It's a, uh, when I talk to the people who are coming on to Logan, and I, I, I feel like you all are involved in this effort now. You're, you're, this, this thing about the uh, autism center here for folks who are going to go to college, it's, it's friggin', that's a great idea, that's, that's a great idea. There are so many other conditions than autism. It's just, that's a slice of this developmental disability pie, if you will. But uh, I, I, I think it's a well worthwhile effort. Uh, as, as more folks find services harder to get and, and find money and funding to stay off the streets harder to get, then you're gonna run into more and more people who are on the spectrum or MRMI in some way, to use integrated language, um, which I'm prone to once in a while. Uh, it's not gonna go away, it's, it's growing. You, you see that, I expect you see that already. I know we do in St. Joe County. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're kind of a magnet because people know that there are services in, available up in our area and they come from out of state to, to go there because the service, and isn't that a treat? So uh, it just keeps everybody pretty busy. But the police up there, I think, have found that this has, this has been working. Uh, I think Captain Hammer, who just retired, uh, but the captain in South Bend Police there for a few years before that, uh, said that he thought that the trainings and the information was making a difference, uh, and that the issues they had with them were more uh, issues of uh, personality conflicts between uh, different members of the force over whether this should have gone that way or that. And that's just a question of sorting through something and living with it long enough to let the rough side drag and let it get smooth. Um, we're in it. Uh, it's, it's happening. I think the, the idea of, of finding out who's here in the area, maybe who you can, if you're thinking in terms of that, uh, if you find that, that this is impacting your day uh, to a degree enough that it's worthwhile investing in something like that, it's a chance to poll and find out who are the players in your area. Uh, what is their role? Can you tap them? Can they assist you in, in dealing with this individual in a way that does good for him and does and takes care of your needs and, uh, and doesn't skirt the legal issues but puts a person where they stand a chance of progressing rather than that's it, you're in the lockup. Uh, or, or, or worse, you know, you've got a court and you're off to jail. So I run into that. I run into that a lot. You know, there's a, there's a certain, a, a couple more things if you don't mind. There's a certain syndrome, if you will, um, and, and I, you know, I have a daughter with developmental disabilities um, you'd be hard pressed to get her to talk to you about that or to admit that. There's a certain stigma still involved in, in an IDD diagnosis. 
and folks are going to do their dangest to convince you that they ain't it, and they could very well be. So you know, some of some behaviors, some associations. Talk about vulnerability. Talk about uh, being able to influence somebody to go down the wrong path. You want to be cool. You want to hang with me. Get in the car. We're going to go jack up a couple of people or do some scrapping. Unquote. Uh, they're going to jump at that because it's a chance to hang. It's a chance to hang with the big kids. It's a chance to avoid that label. And, you know, so they end up in a sling and then they see you and they see me and they see the jail. So the more information you have, the more hints you have, and Joe is, uh, Josh is going to give you some more, um, and the more players you know, the more people you know that are invested in the process who can help you and you have their, their information, they, everybody who was involved in this training volunteered who would be able to respond to an officer if they called at 2 in the morning. Now, my department, we're 24-7. These guys all live with their cell phones, so 3 in the morning is 3 in the morning. But it's something you can set up with, your, with the providers in the area so that if you're faced with these type of situations, you're not acting solo and being asked to be a psychiatrist uh, uh, or a doctor. Uh, but, and it's like me. <laughs> I think I'm the director of Logan Protective Services because when the last director left, I was the only one willing to touch it with a 10-foot pole. It, not necessarily that I was overqualified. I don't know everything, but in the years that I've been there, I've come to know a lot of people who know a lot. So people can come to me. I might not be the one, but I may have a name and a number. So those names and numbers are just as valuable as, as if you had a couple of letters after your name, if you know somebody who does. So it's, it's a question of reaching out, finding out what is out there, who's acting, and coordinating those. Because that is the key, I think. When everybody gathers around one topic or one aim, one program, and brings what they can to that circle, oh, hey, boom, you're, you're, you know, you're way ahead of the game. You're off and running. So it's still being set up. I, I wish I could come down and give you a notebook that said, here's the program. It's working 100%. You'll love it. Uh, I can tell you, like I said, about our experiences, it was, it was we thought we had it, and then Madison blew up. It took three more years to come back with the, the, the next set of players and get it going again, but we did. And it's, it's making a difference uh, in that we're not having as many people spend a lot of time in the county jail before it's sorted out as to where they actually should be. Where, where is it good for them and good for society for them to be? You know? So this effort here, um, with, it's an autistic uh, type of focus. Uh, is, is like a subset of, of this whole effort that I think, if it's not here, it will be, as, as we have this urban sprawl. So when St. Joe County comes this way, a uh, little humor there, uh, then you'll be ready. Okay, uh, I appreciate you having me here today. I, we're a small department. I've got five caseworkers, an administrative assistant, and myself. Uh, we serve uh, about 100 and 50 people and another 50 people we have connected up with volunteer guardians. We have we have guardianships, actual out and out guardianships for about 70 people uh, through our department uh, because they couldn't make decisions for themselves or because they were the deeper end of the pool uh, situation wise and you know are severe profound and, and needed that type of protection and had been abandoned. Uh, they're a great bunch but it, it really takes uh, being able to go out to find out who's out there, who's doing what, keep your ears on, and they may, it may be just a piece of information you need for your next stop, you know. Uh, so we're trying up north, and, and, uh, and feel free to call. I got some cards I'll leave right here. If, uh, again, I may not have an answer, but I might know somebody who does, so uh, feel free to give me a shout. You want this? Okay. I'll get that out of your way. Let me just pull this out of your way. If I can get it. <laughs> As Josh is setting up, there, there's an outline of his presentation on the centers of somebody's round tables. If you do not have one, uh, go to the table that has extras. Raise your hand. Should we take notes as we go? And I, I'm actually going to start off at slide number eight. I actually want to get to the things that I hope are going to be most practical for you in the limited time that we have left uh, in terms of you being able to do your job and being able to leave with something practical here. Uh, autism.
OK, uh, let's get back to where I was here. Uh, so essentially, I'm, I'm going to focus specifically on things that, that you might encounter in your work. Um, you know, some of the questions that I asked here were uh, of some of the parents, how would your child react in this certain circumstance? Uh, as we said, autism in particular is not something that has identifiable facial features. In fact, we diagnose it not based on a medical test, but we actually diagnose it based on behaviors, uh, which makes it different from Down syndrome or, or other diagnoses. Some individuals with developmental disabilities, you might be able to tell based on physical features. But in most instances, um, you aren't necessarily going to be able to make that get that information unless somebody tells it to you. Here's the thing is I'm never going to be able to teach you to be able to diagnose autism. Uh, there are people that go to school for that for years. And there are still some cases that are really hard to diagnose. So what I'm going to try to do is, is in cases in which you know that you're working with somebody with autism or with a developmental disability these are things that you might see that shouldn't surprise you uh, and hopefully we can talk through how to handle some of these situations in particular you're going to see variability in communication some people might be incredibly verbal and talk to you almost like they're a professor talking to you and trying to teach you something uh, but they might have trouble understanding what you're saying Vice versa, there are going to be some individuals who have almost no verbal ability and might actually use an iPad to be able to communicate with you. There are actually uh, programs now that are in iPads that can help people use that iPad to communicate, and that's their form of communication. So you're going to see a lot of variability in people of intellectual and developmental disabilities and how they're able to communicate. What's interesting and what some of you might have encountered already is that when in a high stress situation, somebody with autism might actually not talk back to you, but they might repeat what you say back to you. They might, that's something that's called echolalia and is actually uh, quite common in autism. So if you're talking to somebody with autism and they're repeating back to you what you just said, they're not insulting you or trying to disobey you. They might be using that either as a way to de-stress. They might be using that as a way to try to say again what you just said to understand it. But if they're repeating what you're saying, sometimes called scripting, uh, it's something that they might be doing themselves to help themselves understand or calm down in that situation. Sometimes this, this scripting might be something that they've heard uh, two or three weeks ago or a month ago. It might actually be they're repeating their favorite lines from their movie or something that their mom said like, don't go in the street, don't touch your sister, which might seem completely irrelevant to the situation that's happening right there, but it's really all they have to be able to cope with these high stress situations. So these are some behaviors that you might see that might seem unusual, but they're instances in which the individual with autism is trying to cope with that situation or with an intellectual disability. Uh, individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities uh, have, a, have a, many of them have a need for routine to have things happen the same way, uh, for things to be predictable. So you can see in your circumstances how those are going to be the absolute uh, scariest situations for them uh, when they aren't pre predictable. In addition to that, uh, individuals with autism in particular will often seek order. They'll have behaviors that they'll do over and over again that are predictable. Uh, this young man right here, if you can see him, he's put all of his toys in size order before he went to sleep. That's just a small example of what a child might do that might uh, put sort of an order to their world to help them process uh, the situation that helps relax them. So you can see in situations in which there's some sort of chaos, how that can be really disruptive and stressful to them. In addition, you've heard many of the families talk about sensory sensitivity. Here's the thing that's tricky about sensory sensitivity. Sometimes that might be stuff is too loud or too bright or too chaotic such that you try to escape from it. But for some individuals with autism, they might be sensory seeking. Uh, I know you were talking about your son rocking. That's actually trying to get sensory stimulation. 
Uh, other individuals with autism might want to press their head against something or bang their head against something. That's actually seeking out sensory stimulation. Now, what's interesting, both of those are involved in that same sensory process and either avoiding loud sounds or seeking some sort of stimulation is often used in stressful situations to calm the individual down. Uh, so it definitely something to be aware of when you encounter somebody in those situations. And another thing that you've heard us talk about is this tendency for some individuals with autism uh, to wander or to elope or to escape. So these are all really common behaviors that especially in stressful situations that you might encounter. Now uh, here's some of the things uh, that you might see that an individual with autism uh, might not be able to process. Again, they might not be able to recognize the danger of a situation, of a gun being pointed in some sort of standoff, traffic, uh, deep water or fast rushing water. They might like to play in water, but they might not see the danger of uh, a river that's overflowing or um, some sort of situation like that. So they might unwillingly put themselves in a more dangerous situation. Uh, individuals with autism often have difficulty understanding emotion and facial expressions. Uh, so uh, when somebody is upset or scared, they might have difficulty processing it and again, not truly understand the situation. Some individuals with autism, if you talk to them, they might not even respond to their own name. They might be listening and they might be understanding, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to respond when you need them to respond. So you have to understand that in those circumstances that they might not, they might be listening to you, but they might not respond even with those simple commands. Uh, when we talk about some of our older individuals uh, that are still really verbal and might be in general education schools, if they're in situations in which they encounter uh, uh, an officer or, so, or they're involved in some sort of criminal activity, we're finding more and more that they actually don't understand what Miranda rights means. And a lot of the tests that we use right now to determine whether somebody can understand their Miranda rights, uh, they actually aren't representative of how much an individual with autism might understand. Even if they uh, are a very, very intelligent individual with autism, they might have difficulty with complex concepts such as that. Uh, so as much a, a, as possible trying to understand what, what this person is understanding and what they're not able to understand, both at a very basic level and for some of the individuals that are really, really smart. So in these stressful situations, it's important to understand that even as much as you might ask, an individual with an autism or an intellectual disability might not respond to you and might actually echo what you're saying. Uh, part of that comes from fear. Uh, part of that comes from not understanding, being scared in a situation. They will be, that many of them will be frightened by the chaos, the unpredictably, unpredictability, the shouting, the lights. And especially in these circumstances, individuals with autism will sometimes go into sort of a, a fight or flight reaction where they might aggress out for not understanding to try to what they perceive as protecting themselves. In, in the case of a fire, for example, they might flee. They might hide under their bed or hide into a closet. Uh, they might try to get away from a situation uh, in a place that might not actually be safer for them. So they might not realize the danger of the fire. They might try to get away from it by put, and put themselves into a more dangerous situation. And what's also really important, you know, I was interested in the circumstance that you were telling about, uh, you know, your, your son that was in the corner and was sort of rocking and there was so much else that was going on that there wasn't, you know, there wasn't necessarily somebody paying attention to him at the time. Uh, what's especially important, especially in a more chaotic situation, is that that individual might actually not be afraid of the situation, but might take that as an opportunity to go wander or explore or elope. Some of these individuals we have to give a lot of attention to or else they'll escape. In these dangerous situations, they might not recognize the danger and see it as an opportunity to go down to the river or to go across the street or to go play with the neighbor's dog who may or may not want them to play with them. Um, so just highlights the importance of 
the individual with autism in those situations, if there's any way that we can place somebody with them to be able to watch them or help them or care for them in that situation, it's going to keep that situation from being even more dangerous than it would be otherwise. So I wanted to sort of summarize a couple of the, uh, of the tips, which I think almost all of them were brought up, but I wanted to try to organize them as much as possible to reinforce some things that are really, really important. Uh, if there is a caregiver, try to utilize them as much as possible. I know there aren't, the caregiver isn't always there, but as much information as you can get from the caregiver, whether it be from the dispatch, getting as much information as they can, from the person who arrives at the scene, think of things like, okay, how does this person communicate? Who do they listen to? What helps them calm them down? What do you think is setting them off in these circumstances? All of those bits of information are going to help you help that individual in that circumstance. And the thing I want to emphasize is that, you know, when we think of caregivers, we often think of parents or we think of somebody who works with them at school. But again, this could be a friend. It could be a neighbor. It could be for an adult, sometimes there is a direct support professional that is assigned to work for that individual. As much as possible, find somebody who knows that individual who's going to be able to help you in that circumstance. Uh, the thing that I would say, though, is that, and the, the thing that I've heard the most uh, from some of the people that I've talked to is, what if the caregiver isn't present or is not helpful? And there are certainly just as many circumstances in which the caregiver isn't present or sometimes might be having uh, their own situation that they have to deal with, might be scared or injured or, or actually might be dealing with some of their own situations. So we're going to go through some other things. But again, uh, when you arrive at a scene, if you can identify a caregiver that would understand that individual, it's going to make everything a lot easier for you in that circumstance. So uh, my my cousin has been on the force in Michigan for 25 years uh, and he said that the best advice he was ever given with working with people with developmental disabilities uh, was to be patient uh, and this was actually the first thing I had on here already after talking uh, talking about parents and I wanted to sort of give a shout out to him as I was talking to him because some of the things I think Emily you were talking about this a little bit before the idea of, of giving space, giving time to respond, avoiding quick movements, avoiding not loud noises, and, and giving the individual time to be able to process the situation. You, in your role, have to try to process things as quickly as possible. But many individuals with de developmental disabilities, if they're not given time to process the situation, they're going to react whether it's fight or flight, uh, whether it's you know, sort of shutting themselves off, uh, being as patient as you can with that individual. Can't do that in every circumstances, but given the opportunity to be patient, to be calm, to, be, to understand how your voice and how your body language might be perceived by that other individual, it's really going to help them. This idea of simplifying what you said. We talked about breaking things down into single steps. Individuals with developmental disabilities and individuals with autism have varying levels of their ability to understand instructions. So as much as you can walk through with somebody step by step by step what you're doing. I give the example of my brother. Uh, you would say, okay, Shane, we're going to put you on the stretcher now. And then you get him on the stretcher. Okay, Shane, we're going to wrap something around your arm. And we wrap it around your arm. Okay, Shane, what we're going to do is we're going to take your blood pressure just to make sure that your heart is okay. Like just giving simple explanations, even if you don't think that that individual is going to understand them, just walking them through that is going to help them feel more calm in these circumstances. As much as possible, try to identify how that person is able to communicate with you. Some individuals are going to be able to use verbal abilities. Some individuals are not. Some individuals might have to communicate through somebody else. Some individuals might actually have a book, like a flip book, that's in their, whoop, as I drop my wallet, 
uh, might actually have a flip book in their wallet that they use to communicate that has pictures in it. Some individuals are going to use an iPad. It might, you might think, why is this person carrying around their iPad? That's not helpful in this situation. But there's a possibility that they have a, an app in that program that helps them to communicate. So as much as you can, try to in, identify how that person communicates to give them the ability to communicate with you. Not everybody's going to be able to communicate in those situations, but as much as you can identify those things, it's going to help you in those circumstances. And again, uh, as you're working with the individual, walk them through step by step, even if you don't think that they understand what you're saying. We talked about touch. Many individuals with autism, especially in high stress situations, uh, are sensitive to touch. Uh, so again, this was already stressed to not touch somebody unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, if somebody is, is rocking or they're flapping their hands or doing some sort of behavior over and over again, likely those sorts of things are helping that individual calm down uh, so I wouldn't necessarily stop them from doing those sorts of behaviors unless those behaviors are some sort of injury to themselves or to somebody else. So for example, if somebody's just rocking like this, that's not necessarily hurting anybody and it's probably helping them calm down. But if that individual is beating their head against the wall, then that's an instance in which their own safety trumps some of these other rules that we've talked about. So again, these repetitive behaviors can take different forms. Uh, and, but as much as possible, you don't want to, to touch somebody or stop these behaviors if they aren't hurting themselves or hurting other people. Now, in the instances in which uh, you do have to put some sort of, 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 of hold or touch an individual with autism. Uh, and Jack and I have talked about this a little bit. All of our staff go through a safe hold training. Uh, and that's not something I could, I could teach today. And I'm sure you've been taught different types of holds in different circumstances. But specific to people with autism and people with developmental disabilities, there are certain holds that can be taught that would both keep that person safe and keep you safe when you have to put a hand on somebody with a developmental disability. Now I have some resources for you that you guys can look into in case you're interested in following up with a training like this. But this is something that I think would be really interesting and really powerful uh, if you hadn't had some sort of hold training, safe hold training, both for you and both for an individual with developmental disability that I think will actually help you in multiple circumstances. And again, if you're about to touch somebody, if you're about to put some hands on, put your hands on somebody, once again, talking through what you're about to do and why you're going to do that. If you have the opportunity to do that, it's going to help you in that circumstance. Now, again, as much as possible, try to be aware of the signs of frustration or things that might be escalating the situation for that individual. If there's anything that you can do to remove the individual from that situation, if it's the fact that there's a lot of people around, I know you talked about the one instance where you had to remove the individual in the school from the other people so that they could relax in that circumstance. If you can sense what that source of frustration is and you can eliminate that source of frustration, that's going to help you with the de-escalation prospect or process. Uh, if there's a way for you to safely find a quiet place, for example, if you're transporting somebody with a significant intellectual and developmental disability in an ambulance, if there's any way that you can contact the hospital ahead of time and let them know the specifics of the circumstance that this person uh, might be uh, traumatized by really stressful sorts of situations, you might be able to find a safe place or a quieter place within that hospital to be able to enter. I know that uh, sometimes when hospitals are given some sort of heads up about these circumstances that they, they might, they might not, but they might be able to adjust the circumstances for that individual. These are, so, these are in your packet uh, in terms of de-escalation training and in terms of, of holds training. 
for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and this would also uh, probably apply in a lot of mental health circumstances. At our sites, uh, we use what's called professional crisis management or PCM training. Uh, there's also, uh, for, for some of our adults, we use a, a MANT system. So there are different systems that you can use uh, to, to work on de-escalation with individuals with developmental disabilities and also uh, for safe holds for that individual. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I've provided that resource for you and I'd be happy to talk to you uh, a little bit about what those sorts of things involve. Um, you know, what's interesting about the scenarios that I provided, every single scenario was brought up by one of our panel members. I have been talking to uh, people in the field about different scenarios, uh, and what's interesting is these were the three scenarios that I chose. Uh, you get a call that a parent is at home and cannot find their child with autism, the child is not in the house or in the yard, this idea of elopement. We had the instance of the individual who, who had eloped, uh, that we talked about for a bit. Uh, scenario two was you get a call from a school that an adolescent with autism is being aggressive toward teachers. Uh, we were able to talk about that scenario a little bit. And interestingly, the third, the third scenario that I had was you get a scene with a man who is suffering a heart attack. The other person at the scene is the man's 39-year-old son who is nonverbal and has autism, which is not that far from your scenario in which both of the parents uh, had been injured uh, and the individual with autism needed help. Um, so we can, we can talk about those scenarios if you like, but given the time frame, uh, I wanted to see if any of you had questions for me or for Jack or for any of our panel members or things that we could talk about and talk through. Um, the, I have my contact information up here. You can always contact us if you have questions, but I wondered uh, if any of you had anything you wanted to talk about further now that we have this opportunity. Well, I, I thank you, everybody. You know, everybody has already said thank you for your service. My first picture, uh, going back here, that was my father and me for the Memorial Day Parade back in the day. I really thank you for all that you do. It really means a lot to me. And this is my brother. This is my little brother, Shane. He's, he's, uh, he's not a kid anymore, but he'll always be my little brother. He's 30, 38 now, but uh, he was once a little guy like that. But, uh, but thank you, everybody. I really appreciate Yes, yeah. I was going to say, uh, you know, first responders going on to that scene, and uh, you're talking about adults that might be able to give information about that particular person. Yeah. Absolutely, and brothers and sisters, even if they look young, even if they're 10 or 11, might actually be an incredible help uh, for their brother or sister if their brother or sister is acting out because they probably know that individual just as well as the parent does. Uh, and in many ways, in some instances, the individual is gonna respond better to their brother or sister or sometimes a friend than they would to you in those circumstances. So it's not just the adults, you're absolutely right. It could be another loved one or a friend or a companion who could help out in that circumstance. Yes. Jay. I just wanted to ask you, you talked about, um, talk about, um, about um, like Jack was saying, if you know who the players are, if you know who to contact. So would it be helpful between the service providers here and, and the EMTs, the first responders, the law enforcement, would it be helpful if we came up with, with some kind of a, or do you have one already? Do you know who to call? Do you have, like, who to contact at Bowen Center? Or, or, is that, is that not clear? The resources oh, they have. The resources, yes, that, that Ms. Bailey was talking about. Would it be helpful to have something like that, or do you already have something? We have a place uh, in the dispatch room of persons we're supposed to call for 
different uh, types of issues, but I don't think it's well defined. Okay, so maybe that would be something that we could work on. Yeah, you might be able to consult and help expand because you might know of resources that they might not necessarily know about. Yeah. About you know, all these people here that we talked before. The other thing I wanted to bring about Dr. Riley, we were talking about ways that we could help uh, first responders um, in, in your job, and we found that there are these stickers, and I don't know whether your departments would be interested in them or even you know caregivers that when you're working with uh, individuals that lives in the community, but with, um, like the pathfinder homes, okay? There are these stickers, and what this says is alert in case of emergency, child with autism, and it says, uh, may not respond to verbal commands, may resist assistance, or may wander off. Would this be something that you would find either, either the pathfinder-like people or first responders that you would find useful? When you go to our home, or if you stop a car and this is on the window, or if you go to our home and you see this on the door, get it? Absolutely. Those are available on, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were, we were, we're, we're going to be continuing to discuss what, what might be uh, helpful, how would be the most helpful way it might be available to uh, parents and children off with autism. It doesn't, that doesn't touch some of the other areas. When, when you arrive in a scene and you're looking for hints, you may not necessarily have all the information. Uh, I, I don't know how familiar you are, but the puzzle piece has really become a symbol for individuals with autism, autism awareness, the autism movement. Um, so for example, if you see a car for, that has one of those uh, ribbons that has puzzle pieces all over it, uh, or something that has a lot of puzzle pieces on it to represent it, uh, that's become a symbol for autism, uh, the same way that um, you know, yellow is a symbol for supporting our troops, and uh, we can think of a lot of different symbols like that. This, this puzzle piece has become a symbol for the autism community, so it might be a, a hint for you, even if it's not necessarily this one. Yes, sir. Yeah, you see uh, places where you go and it's a deaf children playing. Yeah. You know, you could have something like that, or I don't know who's putting those out there. It could be parents. I don't know, but if a, a parent has an aut autistic child, they could put, post something like that in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, so if uh, police are going by, anybody can notice that uh, that's a situation mm -hmm. that he should be aware of. It's a, this is a tricky situation too, and I, I want, maybe this is something to ask you all. Um, the, the one concern that I would have with, with putting some, and we, we actually, uh, Jane and I, we, we talked about this a little bit, um, putting some sort of symbol on a house. Uh, I guess my first concern would be whether that might make that individual a target for a crime, um, sexual offenders, uh, people like that. Um, yeah, bullying. Um, the, the, reason, the reason I say that is because we, we know from the statistics that individuals with developmental disabilities are exponentially more likely to be victims of those types of crimes, especially sexual crimes, crimes like that. Um, I guess, I guess my, my question when we were thinking about this, you know, in a first responder situation that would help, uh, but I didn't know if in your experience that would also make somebody a target. Um, for people who might be looking to commit a, another sort of crime. And I guess I, I, would, I would look to you and your experience in terms of, of, of what you would think in that situation, because it seems kind of tricky to me. Now in a car, it's different because most likely if you're in a car, <clears throat> there's somebody with you that, that is caring for you love, or loves you. Um, I, I wasn't sure about on a house though, how that might change things. Yeah. When, uh, when Logan started, which was like in the 50s, um, you know, uh, kids with special needs were Doctors told parents to institutionalize the children because they have them. Um, these were the neighborhood addict 
have children that you know, may or may not know live next door, but didn't see very much of them. This is not that much in the past. Um, you know, Logan's, the, the, the fellow who started Logan, Joe Newman, he's, he started the concept of group homes in Indiana. Uh, he, his lobbying downstate started Park Trust as a way to protect tax shelters, some of the benefits monies for people so they wouldn't lose them if they like, got an inheritance or whatever. A lot of what Logan's done is brought these things more into the modern age, but we're really not that far out of those dark ages. We're really not. And, and in general, uh, maybe our population, maybe we, are better at dealing with differently able people than we were in the past. Uh, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. Uh, folks who, who aren't experienced, who don't have a sieve, who don't have a, a close friend or a neighbor, uh, either with a developmental disability themselves or with somebody associated with them in the group, uh, to teach them. It's, they fear that. They don't know how they would handle it. It makes them uncomfortable. Um, and, and sometimes that leads to uh, less than stellar behavior on the part of uh, themselves or maybe their kids or people who haven't learned differently. So what, what I talk to people is that new higher orientation uh, is that in, in getting involved in these areas and investing yourselves in this and showing people how to deal appropriately, then you're helping move your community out of those dark cages. You're, well, you're policemen slash teachers because you're teaching the community how to approach differently able people in a better way. Uh, so by doing that, by, by taking the time to try to learn these things, you're already prepping yourself to help move that art of society forward. Okay. And I, I appreciate you calling that. Thank you, everybody, so much. I really appreciate it. It means a lot to me as a, a CIB that you would come to an event, event like this and want to, to help out the, the people that we love. So I thank you for that. Jim Riley is the one who wrote the grant to fund tonight's event, and as I said, we're funded grant in the Maine Society um, in Fort Wayne, and Emily Hudson from Minnesota College just did advanced the work of the team. So thank you. Our speakers, our panelists, but the biggest thanks to those of you who took the time to attend, because I know the schedule that you have, and many long days and night calls and all of that, and just to take the time out to come to address this important topic is meant a lot. Um, we're going to produce some DVDs of tonight's event. If you would like a copy that Jane know, or uh, if, if there's a point person in your organization you want us to send it to, email that to Jane and then we can get those mailed out. We'll take well, a we could, just, we could just simply send a copy to everyone who's here. We could. If, you want, if everyone wants one to use it well, we can send it to everyone that's here. How many would like that? They can pass it on. <laughs> okay, one. great. We'll do that, and if you don't have a use for it, uh, you know, we'll pass it on for sure. And I'll let you know the number on that, Tom. Um, if you could take a few minutes in your pack on the right hand side, it is an evaluation form of tonight's program, but specifically to get some ideas on how you, as in your specific role, would, would recommend possible changes. I know our panelists talked some ideas that they had that would be helpful. Uh, we want to capture those so that we can keep these ideas moving forward and not just forget it after tonight. So you can take a few minutes to fill out this form. And then as you leave, or evening is, is finished then, as you leave, you can put them here, uh, and Jane will collect them. We'll put them here on the end of the table. Thank, Thank you. Safe travels. <laughs>